question about uh, related to the slave trade. I had a guest speaker who's about a 60-year-old <coughs> African American man, <coughs> and he responded to a, was responding to a question from one of my students. And my student asked him why he had been attracted to Islam. And what he said was that even though earlier in his life he joined the Nation of Islam and become familiar with Islam and beyond that traditional Islam, that he was really reticent about it because he had learned, and I don't have, I didn't have a background to know, know this, because he would, had learned of the history of, of Muslim enslavement of Africans. And then he got really graphic with my, with my kids. He said that along with the raiding of the, of the African countries for, for slave labor, that, <coughs> that one of the things they would do is castrate young boys in order to take them back to Muslim countries so that they could serve as eunuchs in, in the harems. And it was done very crudely, and he said that 15% of the boys are, are all that would survive the castration, and, and he was bitter. But I, I didn't have the background to know. Well, I don't think there's any basis for knowing about that. But, of course, it's true that there were uh, you know, some eunuchs, but that wasn't by any means you know, masses of, of uh, slaves that were made into eunuchs. That would be a few, perhaps. Um, and furthermore, that's not regarded as legitimate in the Islamic law. That's not allowed. And um, the, um, the slave trade and the history of slavery, of course, that's something that existed throughout human history until the 19th century, except for a few places. Norway is proud to say it was the first place to prohibit and abolish slavery, which it claims it did, I think, about 1,200 or something like that, uh, which may or may not be the case. I don't know the details of that point. I've just seen that that has been said. But the um, fact that slavery existed, that's true. And you can you know, try to euphemize with some other word or something like that. But with regard to the African Americans, of course, this is a battleground, and it is a major card played by Christian polemicists in the attempt to stop the spread of Islam amongst the African Americans. And it has not worked to date at all. And uh, Pat Robertson said on his program, he said, I can't understand why any African American would become a Muslim as a religion of slavery of them, and that is totally stupid, you know, something like that. And of course, if he says that, that will just encourage people to become Muslims because of the actual dialectic of the thing, the, the, the situation. But on the other hand, Afrocentrists, of course, who are extremely anti-Muslim, make uh, this uh, claim. And they, you know, be more of the protagonist, what you call the, the effective protagonists of the argument on this point. Nevertheless, from the time that um, the uh, famous um, West Indian, uh, Edward Wilmot Blyden, went to Africa and uh, wrote his book about the, the Islam, Christianity, and the Africans. Even though he went as a Presbyterian missionary to Liberia, ran in the election for president of Liberia in about, what, 1885 or so, and was the Liberian ambassador to uh, England and France. Uh, by the end of his life, he had, uh, is thought to have become a crypto-Muslim. And he wrote a book in about 1887 in which he said, Islam is better for African people than Christianity. And uh, that, I think, has been the consensus after that. And better in what sense? Well, it's true that there was a slave trade. And the slave trade undoubtedly involved a lot of horrors over its existence. And that would be true of Greek slavery, which is often not featured when we're talking about ancient Greece. And the fact that a huge proportion of the population of supposedly democratic Athens were slaves, maybe as much as a quarter, in fact. Or what I call often the great slave empire, the Roman Empire, 
which had uh, massive slavery that was really horrible. And usually when I'm, when I'm trying to judge whether I should use an ancient history textbook or not, I look and I see what does this book say about the destruction of the two cities of Corinth and Carthage, two of the world cities by the Romans in the same year, 146 BC, which is often written in books that this was an object lesson to the Greeks that they destroyed Corinth. Corinth was destroyed as an object lesson. I mean, come on, give me a break. Talk about biased language. There is a world city the Romans destroyed in their awful conquests. And uh, the other thing I look for is what do they say about Lucius Aemilius Paulus, the famous Hellenized consul who is uh, featured as one of the people who is in one of Plutarch's lives in the biographies carrying off 150,000 people as slaves from Epirus in the year 167 BC, when Epirus was not even a party to the war he was fighting. He just went into a neutral country and carried off a third of the population. So I'm affected by that too. But one does have to realize that in Muslim history and all of these other histories that existed, there was, in fact, uh, uh, slavery in the texts of Islam, slavery is acknowledged, but obedience to masters is not. It is found in the Hadith, however, and that is quasi-scriptural, or even you could say scriptural if you wanted, I think. And in Christianity, of course, in the letter of the Ephesians, I think, is slaves obey your masters. So Christianity is under the gun for that too, in the same respect. And um, uh, it seems to me um, that the only great difference is this between chattel slavery in the American South and Muslim slavery in the history of Islam. And that is that in Islam, an extremely high value is placed on the paternity of the children. Knowing who the father of the child is matters a lot. That is one of the reasons that um, marriage is required. It is one of the reasons that polygamy is, exists. It is one of the reasons that there was concubinage, because if a man was going to sleep around, the idea was he should only sleep around with whom he could sleep with legitimately, and the children ought to be known for their father, who the father is. And furthermore, there was also a principle which is embedded in Roman and most other law, which is that the, the child belongs to the marriage bed. In other words, there is an automatic supposition if a woman is married that the father is her husband, unless it is brought out in a case that has to be tried somehow to prove other than that. And um, in fact, in the Hadith, it even says the child belongs to the marriage be bed and the adulterer gets the stone, We're referring to the prohibition of adultery, leading to adultery being actually a kind of capital crime. Although, as Hamza Yusuf said, uh, the standards of proof were so severe that it was more a rule against public fornication than it was a, a, a rule against adultery behind closed doors because the standards of evidence were very strict. So anyhow, you have the uh, idea of the legitimacy of the children that's very much embedded and the necessity of the father acknowledging the children. And that was what was different with chattel slavery in the American South in particular. And uh, where instead you have this kind of uh, color bar race line where you view the African people are like inferior race. They're like dogs or cattle. Or they're not even human beings that was upheld indeed. And that partly arose out of the Western mind being convinced of pseudoscientific ideas or transferring the fundamentalism of science into the area of social relations and applying it and that kind of result ensued. In Islam though, that didn't obtain. The children of the union always were uh, belong to the father and consequently the uh, mother's background didn't influence whether the child was legitimate or not but the, the child was legitimate provided that the, the uh, woman was whether she was wife or a slave concubine 
Yes. Um, you seem to suggest uh, that there has been an inequity of blame for slavery. Uh, perhaps more of a focus on Islamic history, Islamic cultures, and Islamic kingdoms as opposed to, say, Greek and Rome. And um, I've been teaching world history since 1982, and I've never had a textbook that has failed to mention the huge number of slaves that were used in the building of Athens, for instance. Okay. Not well, I don't mind. I mean, I'm not suggesting that that isn't featured. Just well, to let you know that well, I've taught ancient history many times. No, no, no. And I, I know that that is found in textbooks of history. But often when you have something like a great books course, like our intellectual heritage series at Temple University, where we read the plays of Sophocles and so on like that, and, you know, a, a kind of uh, discourse about Greece being the uh, legitimate origin of Western civilization is, is carried on. And... Uh, Greece had slavery at Athens, and that's not neglected, I grant you that. Even when I went to high school uh, well over 35 years ago, that was mentioned. I mean, it, even in the time before we have modern political correctness, that was mentioned. But it still is not sufficiently emphasized how nationalistic, too, the ancient Greeks were how, uh, what in a, a, a manner they colonized the Middle East and Egypt, for example, the uh, type of relationship that existed in Egypt between the Greek colonizers and the native Egyptians, which uh, was a case of extreme inegalitarianism. Um, and uh, that, I don't think, gets enough emphasis, partly because, of course, the whole Eastern Mediterranean just is not of interest in, in Western history courses often, because once Alexander the Great is done, you would say something about Alexandria being a center of Greek science, and Eratosthenes me measured the circumference of the Earth and something like that, and then that's about it. And then Egypt fades from history. The formal acknowledgement of the paternity of the slave influenced the slave's life. There's no difference. You see what I'm looking for? I mean, well, it would influence the slave's life. A, a woman who gave birth to a child could not be sold. So she acquired a status that wasn't quite the status of a full wife, but she had a status where she could not be sold any longer by the, by the owner. And that, that became a rule. And so she became an umwelet. See, and why should, couldn't she be sold? Because it wouldn't be suitable, of course, to sell the mother of your child. That would be an outrage. And so that wasn't allowed at all. And um, the um, children followed the father. So if the father was freeborn, the children were freeborn, period. And they were his children. And they were, uh, in the sight of the law, equal to the other children. Now, granted that in the Umayyad dynasty, the children of the slave women were not allowed to become caliphs except uh, the last two caliphs. And that was at the time when there was disorder. Before that, it was the Arab women, mothers of the caliphs, and in fact, not just any ones, but the ones who came from the most noble lineages. But then often that's been the case with royal lineages in history. I mean, in Europe, you know, the man had to marry a princess if he was the king. He couldn't marry a commoner, generally speaking. Now, in the East Roman Empire, that wasn't the case. But in most of Euro Western European royalty, that has always been the case. They had to marry a noble. And it's only been in this century that that rule has been contravened. And in fact, there was the morganitic marriage, which was that the uh, noble would give the woman a, uh, what was morganitic comes from a word meaning a mourning gift who was a commoner, on the understanding that her children would inherit none of his titles and rights because she was a commoner. And also you had cases like uh, Augustus III, who was the king of Saxony and Poland, who had 300 children. And they were almost all illegitimate. Many of the kings had huge numbers of illegitimate children. I think it was um, Henry I of England had about 17 or 18 illegitimate children. And so, so there was not legitimacy because the king had the power to go around to do what he wanted, unlike our present presidents. Uh, 
and <laughs> don't get away with it. And the king doing that, the children were not thereby legitimated. Now, what this matters as far as race relations goes means that the children of black women who might have been slave concubines were just as legitimate as anybody else. And consequently, they became rulers. So, al malik Saleh Najm al-Din Ayyub, who was the, the, the uh, Ayyubid Sultan of Egypt, who ruled from um, 1240 to 1249, was black. He was a black ruler. He was the one who made the arrangements to fight against Louis the Sixth, Louis the Ninth, in the Sixth Crusade. He fought. He was uh, defeated the Crusaders, and he was a black ruler. And there were other uh, rulers of that nature. And as I think I had already said, the Crown Prince of Kuwait today is that the late King of Morocco, uh, whom I met many times, Al Hassan the, the Second, was. Uh, uh, not black in a black African sense, but he obviously had ancestry that came from south of the Sahara Desert. President Sadat of Egypt, President Mohammed Naguib of Egypt, the present Saudi ambassador to Washington, Bandar ibn Sultan, uh, who was the, the um, son of the second crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and so on. So that then produced a different effect even if there was oppression in slavery to begin with. The other thing is slavery is not legal in any Muslim country today, and there is no mechanism for acquiring slaves legitimately today. So it is considered today to be a dead letter in the religion of Islam. Yes. Two more questions. One, one's, the first one is the one point I want to say. That's why I'm asking. In the American South, there were some laws in the books that were pretty nice in terms of slave rights, but they were not held up in practice. Now, I'm thinking about myself. You know, if, I, if I had a slave and I'm the father, I'd have a very strong economic motivation to deny my paternity so that I could sell that child. So what I'm asking is, were these laws upheld? Yes, they were generally upheld. Because uh, you look all over the Muslim world, see, there's no color bar in Islam. There never was a color bar. There's no color bar racism in Islam. There is, of course, as has been said, a tendency in some of the discourses that have emanated from the Muslim civilization to prefer the lighter color to the darker. And there has also been the contrary of that, the exact opposite. But there isn't any color bar in the sense of we're white and you're black, and that's a border. And remember, even in the United States, in the American South, there were ambiguous people. There were blacks who were so white that they looked whiter than some of the whites looked. And there were whites who had slave ancestry. As was sarcastically said once in the State Assembly of South Carolina, that someone said, I don't think there is a single person sitting here who doesn't have some African ancestry. And that was in some kind of debate, and he was just being mean to his fellow legislators. But anyway, that was in the white period when there were no black legislators, the Jim Crow period. And um, so, um, so anyway, that was the um, response to that. Curiosity question. What if I speak with your slave and the child is produced? Does she remain your property or does she do I have an obligation then to buy her? I'm the father of Well if that's certain, yes you do. You right. have the obligation to to acquire her in that case. But that's only theoretical, mind you, because this is not something that exists now. It really doesn't exist now. It's true that it was only abolished in Mauritania in 1980 and in Saudi Arabia in 1962, but it's not legal. It's not legal in the legal system of any place, and the abolition of it is acknowledged by all of the Muslim jurists. But they handled it that way I mean, in the past. I know, I know we're talking about the past. They handled it, I'd be, under, I'd be obliged to buy her from you. I think that's exactly right. That could be if you were the father of other children by her. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, what if. I mean, this gets well, see, then it would be adultery in that case. It would become like a species of adultery. And um, the. Um, 
You know, on the whole, I think in the discussion, we ought to remind ourselves, though, that most of the Muslims that have ever lived have been monogamous, that there isn't such an excess supply of women over men in the world, that men can generally have more than one wife and that that works. And uh, generally, it hasn't been possible to have more than one wife. And that's usually been the, the prevailing uh, system that, that has existed in the Muslim world. Uh, also, one has to recognize with regard to the African-American and the African dimension that one-sixth of the Muslims are Africans from south of the Sahara Desert. They have appropriated Islam for themselves and they use it for themselves. And amongst the texts that are used, for example, are a fact that suggests that there may have been uh, prevalent color prejudice before Islam is that there are a lot of Islamic texts that say uh, something in praise of the blacks and that mention that such and such a companion of the Prophet was black. So uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was said to be black and uh, Bilal is the famous uh, Ethiopian who was black uh, and Ammar ibn Yasir was black and Usama ibn Zaid was black and uh, Abdullah ibn Khazm was black, and so on, etc., etc. There's also a very charming story of Antar, who is a pre-Islamic poet, Arabian poet, who was black because his mother was black, he was black, and so it's a, a romance between Antar and Abla, and he faced some kind of uh, discrimination on that and overcame it, and that became one of the three main popular sagas that were sung in the Arab world until recently. Just uh, one little piece, because there are only a couple of other American history teachers among us. But uh, you know how our the book that we read in prep said that perhaps as many as 20% of African slaves that were brought to the New World were Muslim. And previous to that, the, the Amistad incident is a piece of Connecticut history. Uh, one of the things that the lawyers, and I'm not sure if it was Roger Sherman and Baldwin at that point, but one of the <coughs> ways that, because you've seen the Amistad, if you've seen the Amistad movie, you know that the, the key point was were they born in Africa or were they born in Cuba before 1820? And one of the things that was used in court <coughs> to try to prove that they were from Africa is that there were among the Amistad captives um, those who recognized and responded to Islamic prayers. So there were Muslims in that group of people, and that was brought out in court, it was used in court to help prove that they were from Africa and could not possibly have been from Cuba before 1820. Because the incident happened in 1839, and the idea is that their Muslim understanding would have been crushed had they been actual Cuban slaves for the last 20 years. Okay.